our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for the privilege of prayer. To know that there is an avenue that is always open for our petitions to be heard by the sovereign of the universe. Thank you. And thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that is to impress our hearts and our minds, even in what we should pray for. Father, I pray that this morning that you would bless our understanding of the word. That as we look at what has been called the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith, I ask, Lord, that we would be uh, better grounded in what we believe. Bless us and help us as we study, as we run to and fro. This we ask and pray in the worthy and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. It is indeed wonderful to be with you this morning after our, what is it, week, or excuse me, month, month-long break um, from each other's presence. At least for me, I haven't seen you all in a month, all of, all of last month. Didn't get a chance to uh, worship with you, but it is indeed a privilege this morning. And even more so with all of the uh, additional visitors that we have today, uh, welcome and God bless. You know, as the song was being sung, I love that song, by the way, and you sounded wonderful this morning singing it, but um, that particular song, the final stanza is the one that always gets me. Do you realize that pretty soon we're going to say farewell to prayer? Does that ever, do you ever really contemplate that, that one day we will no longer have to pray? We'll be able to speak to our Lord face to face. Isn't that wonderful? And that day is soon coming. Soon coming. I want to read something uh, with you this morning. I'm going to start off with a quotation. And I had referenced it in the prayer. This is Great Controversy, page 409. Very familiar statement but it will uh, lay the foundation for what we're going to go over this morning. So it says, The scripture which above all others has been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. These had been familiar words to all believers in the Lord's soon coming. By the lips of thousands was this prophecy repeated as the watchword of their faith. Watchword just simply being a core principle or the core belief of their faith. All felt that upon the events therein foretold depended their brightest expectations and most cherished hopes. And of course, that remains true today for all Advent believers. It is still the foundation and central pillar of our faith, and being so, I find that it is also one of the most attacked doctrines of our faith, as well as one of the most misunderstood. And so I want to take time with you this morning, and maybe, maybe we'll do it in two parts, I don't know, but we'll take time to look at the 2300 Days And I'm sure all of us have looked at it before. I'm sure all of us have studied it. You've gone to uh, Daniel and Revelation seminars. You've seen it presented. You've heard it over and over and over and over again. I'm confident that that's the case. But if you were to ask yourself a question, and this is a challenge that I put forth to all Seventh-day Adventists, how many of us, even though we have heard it before, actually understand to the point of showing someone else. 
because that's where the rubber really meets the road, right? Now, I, I, I don't know if this is true. Maybe I shouldn't even say it. Um, but it's something that I've heard many times before. A good friend of mine uh, uh, from, from Cuba actually uh, told me this story. And like I said, I've never been able to really verify it. But it was something that he was told, so on and so forth. But the principle, I think, the core of the story is important. All of us have heard of Fidel Castro, yes? All right. And there was a time under uh, Fidel Castro in Cuba where uh, the Adventists, uh, many of the Advent uh, believers had to flee that particular country in order for them to continue practicing their faith. And a good friend of mine whose family uh, came over in a raft uh, from Cuba, of course, uh, there to, to Florida. And, um, you know, even uh, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember the story correctly, uh, one of them swam alongside the raft. That's a long way, right? But there was something that they, they told me that I always thought was, was pretty powerful, and that was that Fidel Castro himself had a connection with the Advent faith early in his life. And that was that one of the, uh, those that helped raise him was a Seventh-day Adventist believer that taught him the 2300 days. And that was actually something that he would use as a test for those who claim to be Adventists. That if you're an Adventist, tell me the 2300 days or teach it to me. And of course, those who could, I don't know necessarily if they were free, right, or those who couldn't if they were, were, were in prison. But the point is that Adventism is built upon the 2300 days, and it didn't take an Adventist to understand that. And so, friends, we need to understand the 2300 days. What do you say? So we have been going over the book of Daniel. We've taken a break for, for a while now from the from the parables. We have been going through the parables of Christ. We finished a parable and we took a little break to walk through Daniel. Pastor Taylor is going through the book of Revelation. We were doing Daniel in Sabbath afternoons and um, then we kind of moved towards uh, uh, the uh, sermons on Sabbath morning, at least in my portion. So we're, we're going to continue with that. Uh, we've covered Daniel 2, we've covered Daniel 7, now we're in Daniel chapter 8, uh, and then in, uh, some are even going over the story, story aspects of Daniel, which are very important also to help us understand some of the themes even of Revelation. But we're moving towards Daniel's final vision, that's the whole point. So we're almost there, amen? We're almost there in Daniel's final vision. So we're looking in Daniel, the 8th chapter. And in Daniel, the eighth chapter, just by way of review, just a little bit, um, we've looked at the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, right? We, we connected Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 7 uh, along with Daniel chapter 8. We know the kingdoms of prophecy start with Babylon, although Babylon is not mentioned specifically in the vision of Daniel, the eighth chapter. And then it goes from Babylon to who's next? Who comes after Babylon? The Medes and the Persians. Right? And in Daniel, the eighth chapter, the Medes and the Persians are described as a ram with two horns. And then after the Mede and Persian kingdom, who rises next as the third kingdom? Greece. And in Daniel chapter 8, Greece is referred to as a, a ram with a, or excuse me, a goat with a notable horn. And so this goat with a notable horn is Greece. The notable horn is the first king, Alexander the Great. We've looked at this stuff together already. So as we, 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 we dealt with that, then we moved into the two abominations of Bible prophecy that is referred to in the book of Daniel chapter 8. And so we walked through Daniel 8 and we saw the little horn power is a more explain. how can I say it? The little horn power in Daniel chapter 8 means more than what you learned in chapter 7, right? Chapter 7, the little horn was who? Who's the little horn in Daniel 7? Papal Rome. Now, Pastor Taylor can't answer. All right? All right? Unless nobody else does. <laughs> All right? So, who's, who, who, who's the little horn in Daniel 7? The papacy. But in Daniel 8, which sometimes confuses people, the little horn in Daniel 8 we saw were the two phases of Rome, both pagan and papal Rome. 
And so we saw the two abominations in Bible prophecy, uh, the, the abomination of desolation or the transgression of desolation are terms for Rome, papacy specifically, but in Daniel 9, which we're going to be getting into shortly, um, it's a symbol of both pagan and papal Rome, but we talked about that. Then we got into the last thing we looked at in the book of Daniel was the daily. We saw what the daily represented, that the daily was not the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Very simple logic. We were talking about this in the, in the pastor study this morning. Uh, the daily in the book of Daniel tramples upon the sanctuary and the host. Daniel chapter 8 verse 13. It's a trampling power. So how can that be Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, trampling upon his own sanctuary and his own people? It does not make sense, right? But that's a common belief. It's a belief that's held dear to many a good Seventh-day Adventist. Unfortunately, that belief does not allow them to really move further in Bible prophecy. And so there's many skewed understandings without the correct understanding of the daily. So we talked about that. We saw it represented paganism, how p the powers of paganism and pagan Rome specifically, but paganism in general were the powers that trampled the people of God to a point where the papacy, the abomination of desolation took over. So that was the last thing that we studied together. So now we're in Daniel the eighth chapter. You're with me in Daniel the eighth chapter. We're gonna pick it up in verse 13. Daniel chapter 8, what verse are we going to? Verse 13. The Bible says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? There's much to be said in verse 13 but it's a little bit out of the scope of what we want to touch on this morning. So I'm going to put a pin in that. Is, our, is that fair? We're going to put a pin in verse 13. Um, I will say, however, I want you to notice verse 13, the question between the heavenly angels, the question that's there is twofold. Do you see that? How long shall be the vision? It's a question of duration. How long shall be the vision concerning what? The daily and the transgression of desolation. It's a twofold question. And how long will they get both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Twofold question. Do we see that? But the answer in verse 14 is singular. The Bible says, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the what? Sanctuary be cleansed. The question was twofold. The answer was singular. There's reasons for that. Brings out a whole lot of beautiful truth, but we're going to put a pin in that. So what I want to focus on with you is specifically verse 14, 2,300 days to the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, Gabriel, Gabriel is commissioned in verse 15. The Bible says in verse 15, let's, let's just look at verse 15 and 16. It came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, who? Gabriel, make this man to understand what? The vision. So Gabriel is commissioned by, by Palmoni, the wonderful number, who is Christ. He's commissioned by Christ to make Daniel understand the vision. Very, very clear commission. Now we know that Gabriel begins to pick up, specifically in verse 20, he begins to go through the vision. He starts with the ram. He explains that the ram represents the Mede and Persian power. Then he goes into the goat with a notable horn. He explains that that represents Greece. Then he spends about four or five verses going through the principles of the little horn, dealing with the pagan Rome as well as papal Roman power. He begins to weave in and out, back and forth, just like the oscillation of the verses 
we learned in verses uh, 11, 12, and 13, or actually 9 through 12. But no mention of the time. So when it finally gets to the point where Gabriel is, has finished the kingdoms of prophecy, the Bible says in verse 26, notice what it says, verse 26, Daniel chapter 8, and the vision of the what? Evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Now I want you to notice, Unlike what Dan, uh, Gabriel had done previous, he had gone through and explained with, with, with accuracy what the vision represents. When it comes now to time, he says, it's true. Close up the vision. Now, just so that you know uh, what we're talking about here, keep a finger in Daniel, the eighth chapter, but I want you to flip back to Genesis chapter one, just so you can see the language there in the book of Daniel. Notice, notice Genesis chapter 1, and we'll pick it up specifically in verse 5. Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. Gabriel says, hey, the vision of the evening and the morning is true. Now, when you read Daniel 8, you just read through it on the surface. E that's the first time you, you read about evening morning. So sometimes people, people don't really understand, what is he talking about the vision of the evening and morning is true? I, I, I don't get that. So just, just notice what it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. Amen when you're with me. The Bible says, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the what? Evening and the morning were the first day. So an evening and the morning is a what? A day. So when Gabriel says, Daniel, the vision of the evening and the morning which was told you is true. Well, what vision of the evening and the morning or day was told Daniel? 2,300 evening mornings, 2,300 days, right? That's the only time mentioned to Daniel. So when you go back to Daniel, the eighth chapter, when you go back to Daniel, the eighth chapter, and the Bible says, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. And Gabriel's explaining these things to Daniel. He explains with accuracy, at least with the Mede and Persian power and the Greek power, he gives them by name. When it comes to pagan and papal Rome, he gives them by character. But then when it comes to the 2300 days, the time element of the chapter, Gabriel says it's a true vision, but close it up. Does Gabriel explain to Daniel the vision? Yes or no? Not a trick question, right? Gabriel make this man understand the vision. Does Gabriel explain to Daniel the vision? Maybe it is a trick question. I thought about that for a minute. Yeah, it is a little bit, right? Is, is the answer yes true? To a, to a point, right? But does he finish the entire vision? He says no. He says it's true, close it up. So then Daniel picks up in verse uh, 27. Notice what it says, verse 27. And I, Daniel, did what? I fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none, what? Understood it. Now, that can't refer to the ram with two horns represents Medo-Persia. The goat with a notable horn represents Grecia, and the notable horn is the first king. That can't refer to that portion of the vision, right? Because he understood that. What was the only part of the vision that Daniel did not understand or was not explained? The time. The time. Now, we won't go into great detail with this point, but I think it's something very important to notice here. When Daniel hears the time, what does it cause Daniel to do? He faints. Now, why do you think Daniel would take that vision so hard? Beyond, it would be beyond his time, right? Uh, two things you can look at here, and we'll get into it just a, a little bit when we jump into the next chapter. But if Daniel 
Two things to, to think about. If Daniel understood that this 2300 days was literal time, it's not really a problem. It's a couple years, two years. But if I understand that to be prophetic time, a day representing a year, then what does that do for me? I'm going to be dead and gone way before this is, is set right. And this 2300 days was concerning what? The sanctuary. Now, to Daniel, Daniel's thinking of Jerusalem, earthly sanctuary. We know that's the case because you'll see in Daniel chapter 9, he begins to go through a Bible study looking at the time element that God told the prophets of how long Jerusalem would be desolate. And God said 70 years. So you tell the prophets, I have the scrolls, I'm reading these things, it's 70 years, now you're telling me 2,300 years. So Daniel becomes faint, he's thinking about the sanctuary, he's thinking about his people, because Daniel was a student of prophecy, not just a prophet himself, he recognized that the time of the 70 years was almost completed. In his day and age, he would see the people of God set free from the captivity of Babylon. And now he has a vision, Daniel, it's 2,300 years. So he became sick. He became faint. He didn't understand the vision. And that's clear because Gabriel didn't explain the vision. Now, the cleansing of the sanctuary, we'll, we'll get into Daniel 9 in just a moment. But I want you to turn back with me to the book of Exodus. Go back with me to the book of Exodus. I want to take just a few brief moments to talk about the sanctuary itself. Because whatever sanctuary it is, right, whether earthly sanctuary or if there's a heavenly sanctuary, let's say we didn't know that, that is what needed to be cleansed, the sanctuary. So let's see from the Bible what is the purpose of the sanctuary. It's very important for us to understand these things. So we're looking in Daniel chapter 8. We're going to pick it up in Daniel, uh, excuse me, uh, Exodus chapter uh, 25, verse 8. Exodus 25, we're looking in verse 8. What is the purpose of the sanctuary? The Bible says, very, very familiar text, we know this one. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell among them. God wanted the people to have a sanctuary so that he can do what? Dwell among his people. What does it mean to dwell among or to dwell with? To live with, to be with. He wanted to be connected with his people. Would you agree with that? All right. I want you to take that, take that idea... That the sanctuary is for the purpose of God dwelling with, connecting with, being at one with his people. And I want you to run to the book of Isaiah. Go with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah what chapter? 59. And let's pick it up in verse 1. Isaiah chapter 59, we're going to pick it up in verse 1, and when you're with me, a hearty amen. amen. So the Bible said that the sanctuary was so that God can dwell among his people. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 59, behold, verse 1, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have done what? separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not what? Hear. God says, let them make me a sanctuary so that I can do what? Dwell among them. But the Bible says that sin does what between us and God? Separates. So much so that he says your iniquities have hid his, your sins have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. 
That's curious. Notice the book of Micah. Notice Micah, chapter 3. Micah, chapter 3. Micah, the third chapter. And we'll pick this up in verse, verse 4, a little bit of reiteration of what Isaiah said. Notice Micah chapter 3, we're picking it up together in verse 4. The Bible says, Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not what? Hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves, how? Ill in their doings. Here the Bible is describing the sins of the people of God as being uh, the practicing of, of ill things in their doings and it caused God to not hear and to hide his face. Sin does not allow God to dwell with his people. Are you, are you following me? What is the purpose of the sanctuary? God says, I want to dwell with my people. Sin said, I mean, the Bible says sin causes us to separate. All right, let's look at one other text. Go with me to, let's go to Ezekiel. Go with me to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel 39, verse 24. Ezekiel 39, verse 24. Ezekiel 39, what verse are we going to? Verse 24, when you're there, amen. The Bible says, according to their what? Uncleanness and according to their what? Transgressions have I done unto them and hid my what? Face from them. So the Bible shows us in Isaiah and, and in Micah and in Ezekiel that sin separates us from God, he hides his face from us. But something that Ezekiel shows, which is very interesting, is that sin or transgression brings uncleanness. And the uncleanness of sin separates God from his people. But the sanctuary was so that he can what? Dwell with his people. Therefore, the purpose of the sanctuary is to deal with the sin that separates are you with me? It's not just make me a house so that I can stay with you. The purpose of the sanctuary is to deal with the very thing that separates God and his people. And that's sin. And the uncleanness of sin. If you understand that, say amen. All right. I want you now to run with me to the book of 1 John. Run with me to 1 John. This is a scripture that we are very familiar with, I'm sure, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. In light of the sanctuary, the sanctuary has two phases. This is how I'm going to describe it. There are two phases in the sanctuary. And those two phases of the sanctuary deal with the uncleanness of sin that separates God and his people. And those two phases in the sanctuary are termed in the Bible the, the daily ministration and the yearly ministration. Now, the principle of the daily and the yearly ministration are really summarized in this wonderful text in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The daily ministration brings forgiveness. The yearly ministration brings cleansing. But both are ineffectual without our confession. So unless the sinner confesses his sins... Forgiveness cannot be granted, and neither can there be cleansing. Now, this is very important, and I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. This is very important. This is a part, 
that separates us in our understanding from every other Christian denomination. Hear this now. This message of the sanctuary is what makes us different. It's not the Sabbath. It's not the state of the dead. It's the sanctuary that makes us different. Most believe that upon the confession of my sins, I am not only forgiven, but the cleansing also takes part at the same time. Now, in one way, I can go along with that if you give a little bit more explanation. But as far as Scripture is concerned, the Bible has laid out for us a process in the salvific plan. And that process is first forgiveness, and then finally cleansing. Because during the forgiveness phase, there's also a record of sin. And we're going to talk about that and show that very clear. Matter of fact, let's, let's just go ahead and do that since I, since I mentioned it. Go with me to Leviticus. Go with me in your Bible to the book of Leviticus chapter 4. If you wanted to summarize the daily ministration you can take the first four chapters of, of the book of Leviticus. Uh, there's more you can add to that, but you would have an understanding of what they would do in the first four chapters. This is the daily ministration of the priests. Notice what it says in Leviticus chapter 4. I want to let's pick it up in verse 7. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7. Now I'm going to take, well. I won't make any assumptions. I'll say it this way. And I know for many of us this might be redundant, but it's important. The sinner, and what makes the sinner, the sinner was his sin, right? The sinner violates his conscience. Remember that study we had last Sabbath. You went through the Sabbath school lesson last Sabbath, amen? Few people, right? We weren't here at the, at the church, but hopefully you went through your Sabbath school lesson. That lesson on the conscience was powerful. Powerful. You go from having a good conscience, void of offense towards God and man, to where you can have an evil and defiled conscience, till finally a seared conscience. An evil and defiled conscience can be brought back to a good conscience. But when the conscience is seared, it's marked. It's, it's set to a place where it can no longer have any feeling. You are past feeling, the man of God says. And when that takes place, when you're past feeling, the Holy Spirit does no longer operate in the mind. And when the whole Holy Spirit no longer operates in the mind, there's no more conviction of sin. And if there's no more conviction of sin, there's no confession of sin. And if there's no confession of sin, ultimately you're lost. Conscience. Wonderful study. So that individual violates his conscience, the sinner. The Holy Spirit convicts him of sin and righteousness and judgment. And he, 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 he goes according to the law and he selects his lamb. And that lamb has to be without spot and without blemish. And he, 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 he selects that lamb. He takes that lamb as his offering to the door of the tabernacle. That outer court. He brings it there. It's inspected by the priest. It passes. It passes. Go. Then that same sinner that, that committed the sin. And, and selected the lamb. And, and brought the lamb based upon the conviction of his conscience. Now he has to take the knife and kill that animal. And he takes the knife, he kills the animal, but before doing so, he lays his hand upon the head of that lamb. And one of the things we had studied during our uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting is what it means to lay the hands upon. It's more than just a touch. It literally meant they put all of their weight upon the animal. That lamb now bears them up. 
They put all the weight upon that lamb. They confess their sins. Symbolically, that sinless lamb now becomes the sin bearer. And because the sins have gone from the individual that committed it to the sin bearer, that individual no longer has sin on him. It's now on the lamb. Then he takes the knife, kills the lamb, and then, you know, there's a bunch of process. That blood is taken. Now by the priest, the sinner has done his due. He has confessed his sin. He's forsaken his sin. He has brought the lamb as a selection of, of the sin bearer. And now everything else is up to the priest. Isn't the plan of salvation wonderful? When you're convicted of sin, and we are ready to forsake our sin, and we confess our sin, and we accept Christ as our sin bearer, by faith, that's all you do. The rest is up to the priest. Now, you're not going back to practice the sin again. But the rest is up to the priest. The priest now takes the blood. And we'll look at some of the things here in, in Leviticus chapter 4. Since I'm saying it, let's just go ahead and read it. Notice Leviticus chapter 4. And I want to... I know I said we're going to read verse 7. Let's read verse 25 first, all right? Read verse 25 first, then we'll come back to verse 7. So the Bible says, The priest shall take the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of what? The altar of burnt offering, and shall pour out his blood at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering. All right, so some of that blood that contains the record of sin, where is it placed? On the horns of the altar, right? Now also look at verse 7. Go back now, verse 7. Bible says, The priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the blood that contains the record of sins is placed on the horns of the altar of an offering. That blood is carried into the sanctuary and also put on the horns of the altar of, of incense. Are you with me? The Bible also shows that that blood is also sprinkled before the veil. What do we have taking place here symbolically? The sin goes from the sinner to the sinless one, the lamb. That blood of the lamb is now uh, caught and brought into the sanctuary. And there is a record placed in the sanctuary. A twofold record. One of sin forgiven, but also sin recorded. Now, some don't like that understanding. There are some that say, no, in the Bible, sin is only a cleanser. Uh, but that's not necessarily the, the case. Cle uh, sin is, uh, excuse me, the blood is also a defiler. I if you look with me in the book of Numbers, and then I want to go to Matthew with you, but look with me in Numbers. Go with me to Numbers 35. Where are we going? Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35. Let's look together. Let's look together in verse 33. The sinner is forgiven of his sin, but that sin, or the, uh, there's, there's a record now of the sin committed. Uh, that blood is brought into the sanctuary, and yes, the blood will cleanse ultimately, but it also defiles. It's a twofold thing, this blood. Notice what it says in verse 33. Just as a, a, a single Bible text to identify that blood both cleanses and defiles. The Bible says, so you shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, for blood it does what? Defile at the land. Does blood defile? Yes. Then it says, and the land cannot be cleansed by the blood that is shed therein, but by the what? Blood of him that shed it. 
So does blood defile? Does blood also cleanse? Yes, and there's other texts you can go to. So the blood that brings a record of sins will ultimately also cleanse that sin. When does that take place? Well, the daily ministration that takes place with the sins of the individual, where the person confesses their sins are forgiven, that takes place literally every day. That's why it was called the daily. But then you have the yearly ministration. Notice the yearly ministration. I want you to go with me. Go with me to the book of Exodus one more time. And then we're going to turn to Hebrews. But I want to read this. I should have read that before we turned earlier. But go to Exodus once again. We read verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But notice also verse 9. All right, Exodus 25, we're looking at verse 8 and 9. Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9, Bible said, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So the sanctuary that Moses built upon earth, the tabernacle, the movable tabernacle, and you can even show this with, with the, the schematics of the temple that was built by Solomon, drawn up by David. Both of them were shown patterns. Both of them were told exactly how to build it. This was a pattern of the one in the heavens. Now, how do we know this? The Apostle Paul picks up on this point in the book of Hebrews. I say the Apostle Paul. I know there are many who don't believe that Paul wrote Hebrews, but I believe he wrote Hebrews. I believe inspiration says that he wrote Hebrews. But notice what it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Notice Hebrews chapter 8. And I haven't forgotten Daniel, right? We're talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary. We need to understand it needs to be cleansed from something. So notice Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, we're picking it up in verse 1. When you're there with me, amen. Now, we had made some assumptions, a few assumptions. I said I didn't want to take and make any assumptions, but for time's sake, we made a few assumptions. And those assumptions were that we, we understand that the lamb that was selected in the earthly sanctuary system was a symbol of the lamb of God, that would take away the sins of the world. We understand that? So that lamb that they would select had to be without spot, had to be without blemish, representing Christ, who although he took our nature, was never, had never violated his conscience and had never committed sin. He was without spot and blemish of sin. And so that's what the lamb represents. The sinner that selects that lamb is us accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior. The sinner laying his hands upon the lamb, bearing his weight upon the lamb, is when we throw ourself upon our Savior and we pour out our heart to our God. And the sins that we have committed, Christ takes them, they become his. He's the sin bearer. And the blood that is spilt is his blood at your hand. And we must always remember that. The blood that was spilt was by the hand of the sinner. And that same priest that takes the blood is also a symbol of Christ. It's all Christ through and through who takes that precious blood and not only ministers it in the sanctuary, not only takes the, the, the forgiveness of sin or the record of forgiveness into the sanctuary with him, but also record, there's a record there. Remember the horns of the altar? That blood is placed there, the record of sin. Now in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, remember the pattern that was shown Moses in the mount. Let's pick it up in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Paul makes it very clear, I believe. It says, now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the what? The true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. 
For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of what? Heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee on the mount. So Paul makes it clear that the pattern that was shown Moses was the pattern of the heavenly and that the things that were built upon earth were built according to the heavenly pattern and not just the sanctuary and its furniture, but the priesthood also is according to the pattern. Are you with me? Now Christ, when he was on earth, he couldn't be priest according to the law for, for a few reasons, right? He wasn't of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. Right? So his, his priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. But while he was upon earth, he wasn't priest. What was he while he was on earth? He was prophet, but in the sanctuary scheme, he was sacrifice. He was the lamb. And so he couldn't be the lamb and the priest at the same time. In the sanctuary service, as you watch it go, it's all Christ. But it's broken up in its proper phases. The lamb upon earth, then he becomes the priest in heaven. Are you with me? So the Bible shows the earthly was a pattern of the heavenly. Now let's take this a step further. In the book, well, let's stay in Hebrews. Let's do it this way. Go to Hebrews 9. Let's do it this way. Hebrews chapter 9. Now, I want to start with the heavenly. So let's go to Hebrews 9 and let's pick it up in verse, let's pick it up in verse 8. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 8. Amen when you're there. So the earthly is a pattern of the heavenly. So let's read about the heavenly here. The Bible says in verse 8, the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Speaking of the earthly which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by what blood? His own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now jump down to verse, uh, uh, verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with what? Blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no what? Remission or forgiveness. Uh, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. In other words, purified with blood. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without what? Sin unto salvation. The Bible identifies that the, earth, the heavenly sanctuary was the pattern of the earthly. Say amen if you're with me. Everything that we see take place on the earthly was typified by that which would transpire in the heavenly. Amen if you're with me. The priesthood 
The work of the priest, as Paul identifies, he's now specifically mentioning the, the yearly ministry. Remember, we talked the daily. But now he's specifically talking the yearly. You know, they only, the priest on earth, only went into the holy place once every year. They did it every year once, but Christ, his process, what he's doing is not continual. It's a process that he just does once. Are you with me? The Bible identifies here that Christ, when he does return, he's returning without something. What is that? Without sin. Why is Christ able to turn, return without sin? What did you say? Because the sanctuary had been cleansed. Remember, the purpose of the sanctuary is to deal with the very thing that separates God and his people, which is sin. If Christ is coming the second time to reclaim his people, can there be sin in between? So the Bible shows that when he comes the second time, it's without sin unto salvation. Sin would have been cleansed. Now, all of sin wiped away from the universe, that's another process. But between he and his people, there's no longer any sin. Something has taken place. What took place in heaven? was typified by what took place upon earth. So now let's look at the earthly. Let's look at the earthly. Stay in Hebrews. We're looking in Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to pick it up in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verse 1 with me. The Bible says, Hebrews 9 verse 1, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a what? worldly or an earthly sanctuary for there was a tabernacle made the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread which is called the sanctuary and after the second veil the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant over uh, overlaid round about with gold wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, it says the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. The first tabernacle referring to the first apartment. They went how often? No, no, no. In verse 6, what does it say? It says the priest went what? Daily, always, right? They went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, how often? Once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. When you read Hebrews chapter 9, Paul lays down very clearly the daily and the yearly ministration. And then he points to Christ in the heavenly sanctuary fulfilling those things. So Christ, if the priesthood upon earth is a pattern of what Christ would do in heaven, is there a day of atonement or a yearly service that would take place in heaven? Of course, because that's the ultimate pattern, right? That's the blueprint. What they did upon earth has to be represented in heaven. So if there was two apartments in earth, and the first apartment was the daily, and the second apartment was the yearly, would you have the same in heaven? According to Paul, that's real clear. Christ did not go from, from uh, coming out of the grave and being ascended to heaven directly into the most holy place. That would destroy the pattern. But that's what many people would have you believe. Christ first goes, just like the priest, into the holy place. And then at once, the Bible says, at the end of the world, as far as time is concerned with God, at the end of the world, when, when, when time was no longer, Christ goes from the holy to the most holy place. And he begins the yearly service. Now let's look at that specifically. Go with me in your Bible to the book of Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus 16. Leviticus, what chapter are we going to? 16. Now 
Now, we won't read through the whole chapter, but when you look at Leviticus 16, this is a nutshell now. During this day, which they call the Day of Atonement, the wonderful thing about the Day of Atonement is they also had a daily ministration that took place, right? So those who maybe had uh, uh, committed sin or had to have confession made had an opportunity, even on the Day of Atonement, to make sure that their sins were confessed and in the sanctuary before they were blotted out. And that's a blessing. Because if that didn't take place, all of us would be lost already. Right? So the Bible shows that on this Day of Atonement, two goats were chosen. One was considered the Lord's goat, and the other will be called the scapegoat, Azazel. Right? And the Lord's goat would be slain, sacrificed. Its blood would be collected much like during the daily where they collected the blood of the lamb. And that blood now, what is it going to do? Notice what it says in verse 11. The Bible says, And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take of the censer full of burnt coals, a fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. So this separating veil between the holy and the most holy place is now open. High priest is there alone. The incense cloud has gone up, cloud is filling the temple, so that he, when he comes face to face with this Shekinah glory, he doesn't die. The Bible says, and he shall put the incense, verse 13, upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take the blood of the, uh, uh, he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, this is the Lord's goat, that is for the people, and shall bring his blood within the veil, and do that with the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. And he shall make and what? atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins so shall he do with the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it. Remember that altar? Remember the altar of incense that had the blood during the daily ministration put on the horns of the altar? That blood recording the sins of the people which defiled the sanctuary? Now on this day of cleansing, the day of atonement, atonement is going to be made for the entire sanctuary. This is where it's cleansed. This is where the record of sins that was placed there throughout the year is being removed. What put the sins in the sanctuary? What was the, what was the vehicle that brought the sin into the sanctuary? Blood. What is going to cleanse the sanctuary from sin? Blood. Remember the book of Numbers, blood is a defiler and blood is a cleanser. Are you with me? The Bible says... And there shall be no man, verse 17, in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and shall make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the, of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Wait a minute. What was already on the horns of the altar? What did, that, what, what did that blood contain? The record of sins. So if I'm putting more blood on top of that blood, what is it doing to the record of sins? It's blotting it out. This is the process. All right? It's covering that, that, that record. Are you with me? That's like if you had, you know, uh, uh, some debt in the book. 
right? You, 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 you go to the, to the uh, accountant, and the accountant's able to show on the books how you have all of this, this debt that you owe. Now, if you take the ink and spill it all over the book, what happens to the record? It's blotted out. Now, this is a process now. I'm not saying the blotting out takes place there. It's a process. Watch this. The Bible says in verse 19, And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times, and cleanse it, and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Jump down to, jump down to verse 29. This and this shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your soul and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priests make and what? Atonement for you to do what? Cleanse you that you may be what? Clean from all your sins before the Lord. There's a reason why I'm having you read these words. Because on the day of atonement, what is happening to the sanctuary? It's being cleansed. Now, to me, this is pretty simple to see. But there are many that say the cleansing of the sanctuary does, has nothing to do with the Day of Atonement. And that makes me, as a student, scratch my head and say, well, where then in the Bible do you have the sanctuary cleansed any other place? Daniel 8.14 and the cleansing of the sanctuary can only be understood in the light of the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary, which is the Day of Atonement. And the earthly sanctuary's cleansing typifies what Paul said would take place where? In the heavenly. So the sanctuary that's to be cleansed is not the earthly sanctuary that Daniel misunderstood and thought it was. But it's the heavenly. And we'll see in chapter 9 that Gabriel makes that clear. But the Bible says, look at verse, look at verse uh, 33 with me. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary... And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the sins of Israel, for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. The earthly sanctuary system, the day of atonement, that yearly ministration is what represents Christ's work going on now in the sanctuary above. This is for the purpose of the final blotting out of sins. Now you read through Leviticus 16 and the entire process. We're not going to get into that specifically now. But remember there was two goats chosen. One was the Lord's goat that was sacrificed and that blood was used to, to cover the sins that were recorded in the sanctuary. And to cover, when you read Leviticus 16, the blood that was on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. And also that blood was put upon that too. But then something was done with that, the, the other goat, the scapegoat. When the high priest, after doing his work of ministry, comes out of the sanctuary, he takes those sins that he symbolically removes from the sanctuary and now places them upon Azazel. And now Azazel bears the sin. And there will be some that would say, well, the goat that was killed, that does the cleansing, and the goat that now carries the sin are both Christ. You ever heard that before? Azazel represents Jesus. It's taught. But, listen, when you look at the plan of redemption, or just look at the sanctuary as it's being brought down here, that's kind of like the argument about the daily being Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. The scripture says the daily tramples God's people and host, uh, host and sanctuary. The scapegoat, the, 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 the goat Azazel in Leviticus chapter 16, it's the one that finally takes all of the sins and then is brought into the wilderness by a fit man and let loose and dies in the wilderness along with all those who were cut off on the day of atonement that did not confess their sin. That was, that cleansed the camp, but everything outside of the camp was unclean. How does that represent Jesus? 
It doesn't take a lot of Bible study to see that there's a flaw in that idea. Azazel is not Christ that now bears the responsibility of sin on the Day of Atonement. That represents Satan who will one day bear responsibility for all the sins that he has ever caused to be committed and committed himself. And all those who are brought without the camp along with Azazel and cut off on the Day of Atonement represent those who did not confess their sins or who sinned on the Day of Atonement and did not have those sins blotted out. It could have been some who during the year had their sins forgiven. Now I got real, just, God just felt like a little steel come over the congregation. Do you realize if you look in the book of Matthew chapter 18, you know the parable. Matthew 18, where you have that, 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 that man that owed the king a large sum of money. Couldn't pay his debt. King forgives him his debt. He goes outside having a, having a, 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 a forgiven, have forgiven, forgiveness on his books. Then he sees his friend that owes him like 20 bucks and says, where's my money? He says to his friend the same thing that or his friend says to him, the same as he said to the king, just give me time and I'll pay all the debt. But he takes him by the throat, the Bible says, and says, give me all that you owe me. He didn't have to give it, so he calls the police. They throw him into prison until he can pay the debt. Somebody was watching, though. There's always a watcher. The way we forgive others is always watched, friends. And that watcher saw and went and told the king, hey, the man that you just forgave 20 minutes ago, guess what he just did? So the king's like, wait, what? Bring him here. So they bring him back in. Hey, king wants to see you. Oh, cool. Goes and sees the king. King says, wait a minute, you wicked and evil servant. I just forgave you all your debt. This is the language of Matthew 18. I forgave you all your debt. And you couldn't forgive your fellow servant? Cast him into prison. Cast him unto the tormentors until he pays all of his debt. And it wasn't just him, it was his household that were cast out with him as well. And Achan was pulled on him. And then it says, so will my heavenly father do to you if you don't forgive men their trespasses. Wait a minute, what does that parable teach then? My sin could be forgiven, but a forgiven sin is not a blotted out sin. And a sin that can be forgiven can also be placed right back upon you because the record is still there. And if I don't forgive my brothers my, their trespasses, neither will my Heavenly Father forgive my trespasses. And in the ultimate scheme of things on the Day of Atonement, along with Azazel, other people were brought out to camp and let loose, killed, cut off. And that represents those who did not forgive or have their sins forgiven. So the Bible shows that what took place on the earth is what would transpire in heaven. So let's go to Daniel, the eighth chapter now. We're not going to, of course, break down the 2300 days today. We'll do that in part two. But let's go to Daniel, the eighth chapter. Daniel, the eighth chapter. It's important for us to understand how the sanctuary works. There's a two-part scheme in the sanctuary, the daily and the yearly. One deals with forgiveness, the other deals with cleansing. This is the principle of 1 John 1, 9. We confess, he's faithful and just to do what? Forgive our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is sanctuary principle language. It doesn't happen all at once. It's a process. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 26. Daniel 8, 26, in the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterwards I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. And then we pick up in Daniel chapter 9 which really is just a, a, a few months after Daniel 8. The Bible says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, 
of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the what? Years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face to the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Jump down to verse 16. Here we're in the midst of the end of Daniel's prayer. He says, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city. What? Jerusalem. What did Daniel think this sanctuary that needed to be cleansed in that vision of chapter 8 was pertaining to? Jerusalem. And so he went and had a Bible study. He did what every good Bible student would do who doesn't understand something. They go and study. The Bible says he understood by books. He opened up the scrolls. And he went and started studying Bible prophecy. And he says, I understood the number of the years. It was 70 years. And then he turns to praying and and, and confessing his sin and the sins of his people. So that God would turn away his wrath. Again, a lot of good stuff here. But we'll put a pin in it. The Bible says in Daniel 9, 16, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. Because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach unto all that are round about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, hear, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name, for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, our righteousness is, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake, O my God. And uh, for thy city and thy people, which are called by thy name. The Bible shows in verse 20, as we draw this to a close, in verse 20, verse uh, 20 through 23, it says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man who? Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at what? The beginning. What vision is he referring to? Daniel 8. All right, so I want you to start noticing the language of Daniel 9. Why am I mentioning this? Is because there are people that will teach you that there is no linguistic or contextual reason for Daniel 8 and chapter 9 to be together. They don't believe that Daniel 9 has anything to do with Daniel chapter 8. But just look at the language. It doesn't take a Greek and Hebrew scholar to read the English. Notice what the Bible says. It says says in verse 20, While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now, first of all, we know that it's referring to the vision that he just saw in chapter 8. One of the ways you can show that is because the very name of the man is given, which is given only in chapter 8, Gabriel, right? Specifically, Gabriel make this man understand the vision. So we see a connection between the two chapters. Then it says in verse 22, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee what? Skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to what? Show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider what? the vision. 
The vision that Daniel says, I saw Gabriel at the first time, chapter 8. In Daniel chapter 8, was Gabriel commissioned to make Daniel understand the vision? Daniel chapter 8, verse 16, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. He explains to him the ram. He explains to him the he goat. He explains to him the little horn. Then when it came to the time of the 2300 evenings, mornings, or 2300 days, he says what? It's true, but shut it up. So he never explained that to Daniel. Right? So when the Bible says, I'm now come to give you skill and understanding. Right? Then it says, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision logically in context and language. Where is it taking you back to? Daniel chapter 8. It's not hard. But what happens is people try to find every argument that they can muster to not connect the two. Because if you can properly connect the two, that foundation and central pillar of the Advent movement, it shows that Adventism is correct. And then therefore there's no reason to have all these other denominations. Because that's the truth. So the devil does everything he can to fight against the sanctuary, the day of atonement, the investigative judgment, blood not being a defiler and a cleanser. There's only one apartment in the heavenly sanctuary, not two. Everything is all about this doctrine. Because if you can wipe away this doctrine, then guess what? There's no reason for us to be here. But this one, the doctrine that makes us who we are as Seventh-day Adventist people must be understood by us. Because it still remains true. What, what, how did the statement read? What did she say? She said, um, all felt, this is Great Controversy 409, all felt that upon the events therein foretold depended their brightest expectations and most cherished hopes. That still remains true. If we understand what the cleansing of the sanctuary is all about and what it meant that Christ had moved from the holy to the most holy place and now he is in the process of doing the blotting out of sin work, then friends, we would be excited to live in these times and would want to excite others as well. The reason why we are the way we are is because we don't fully grasp the magnitude of the work of our heavenly high priest. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, as we pause in the study today, Lord, we have walked through Daniel chapter 8 together over a, a period of sermons. Today we have seen, Lord, the, 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 the type and anti-type of the sanctuary. We've looked at the work of forgiveness in the daily and the cleansing in the yearly. We recognize, Lord, that Christ is doing that work above, so says Paul. But the language of the Bible is clear that the Day of Atonement was a day of cleansing. And in Daniel's prophecy, that cleansing is connected with the time. Lord, help us to understand the time. Help us to understand the vision. May the work that Gabriel did with Daniel so many years ago be continued by us as we seek like Daniel, by books to understand the time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.